Um, as you know, uh, we've been very closely uh, tracking the travels of, uh, of President Obama. Uh, he, uh, he, he had a, a month of summitry uh, last month, and our speaker today was with him in all those very tough places to be. Uh, Cannes, France, uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, and, uh, and Bali, Indonesia. But I suspect that uh, you didn't get much of a chance to really uh, enjoy the beach in, in any of those places. Um, uh, but we have, to really, uh, we have to really celebrate this time because um, obviously the United States is refocusing on, uh, on Southeast Asia. A lot of that effort uh, centers on the largest country and the, the largest economy in Southeast Asia, uh, that's Indonesia. And we couldn't do uh, we couldn't do what we're trying to do uh, by deep, more deeply engaging the region without a very, uh, a very good, solid foundation in our relationship with Indonesia. This morning's speaker is uh, the architect uh, of a lot of that effort, uh, Ambassador Dino Dijal. He's a good friend. Uh, he is, um, for those of you uh, who follow him on Twitter, you know that he very rarely sleeps. Um, he. Uh, he also uh, takes time somehow to uh, train uh, for a marathon. He just finished the New York Marathon, for those of you that didn't know. Uh, I noticed on, the, on, on Twitter that there's a group of Indonesians who ran that, uh, who ran that marathon, some pretty impressive, uh, impressive runners. Um, so I wanted to thank, uh, thank Dino for breaking training uh, and joining us here this morning. He, uh, he's just been back from this November of summitry. Uh, his perspectives and Indonesia's perspectives are, as I said, fundamentally important to where we take uh, where we take these uh, the follow up from these meetings. So I I'm not surprised that we've packed the house this morning. Um, for those of you who are coming in late, hey, Henrietta, um, please uh, go ahead and, and fill in the front seats here, um, as Dino called them, the scary seats. You know. <laughs> um, but I'd like you to uh, join me in welcoming a good friend and our, our speaker for the Banyan Tree Leadership Forum today, uh, Ambassador uh, from Indonesia, Dino Dijal. Thank you, uh, Ernie, and thank you, for CSIS, for organizing this uh, brief. Uh, and you mentioned about the marathon. Actually, that uh, that must be one of the highlights of my stay in in in, in the U.S. And I think it was a wake up call to, to me as well because I didn't really train for the marathon. I just believed that hey, just get off get off the plane and just put on your shoes and run. That, that's how naively I approached the uh, the marathon event. But uh, apparently, every half hour, my legs screamed to my brain, "Are you kidding me?" You know. <laughs> And I ran for seven hours. Can you believe it? And uh, the only thing that sustained me was uh, the fact that my son, five-year-old Keanu, was waiting at the finish line. You know, and so there's no way I, uh, for me not to finish it. I had to finish it, but he had to wait seven hours for me. At <laughs> Good. Um, I also need to um, uh, apologize about the title. I think we had a very sexy Hollywood title uh, for today, which is the Insider's View of uh, what happened in Bali and so on. Yeah, I think that's, that's uh, Ernie's uh, skill in, in coming out with, with uh, good titles. But I just want to make sure that WikiLeaks is not uh, offended that, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't have any juicy stuff to, to spill uh, to you, but what I do want to do is to give you a bit of update and brief about what's happening, uh, what happened in Bali. But one uh, anecdote I want to share with you was uh, I finally uh, got a bit more appreciation for uh, the security forces that protected uh, Obama. Uh, there was an, uh, a moment in the morning when I'm supposed to attend the signing of a Boeing uh, line deal, uh, $22 billion deal. Uh, it was uh, an event that I had looked forward to. So I went to the room and the security guy, despite the fact that I told him I was the ambassador, really what do you call it, flash this and that and that, and ask me, who are you, blah, 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 you know. Uh, gave me a hard time, but I passed. And then I looked back, and everybody uh, went through the same motion. So I said, okay, fine. But I went in there, and then after, not long after, President Obama came. 
and greeted us, and we were in the holding room together. Uh, and then after a while, an aide came and said, okay, we are ready for the signing now. So we moved from the holding room, and we proceeded to the signing room, but the door was locked. So one guy tried to open, another security guy tried to open, and even President Obama himself tried to open <laughs> the locked door, you know, like this, you know. And that's when I realized, okay, the security is good, you know. They, they were so strict, they even kept President Obama out of his own uh, signing. <laughs> that's a true story, by the way. Uh, but I think President Obama also had a memorable visit. Uh, the, the one thing that struck me was when he got off the plane from the airport to the hotel, it was about a 30-minute ride. And along the road, left and right, uh, people were just lining up to greet him. They were waiting, they had been waiting for hours, uh, and they were waving at him and so on and so on. Uh, there was strong affection that was uh, showed to President Obama. I'm sure he felt that because uh, I think we had many leaders who came to Bali, uh, about 18, 20 leaders who came. But uh, that one special affection where people lined up by the thousands on the street uh, were only uh, uh, displayed uh, during President Obama's uh, arrival in Bali. I think it's something that even our politicians were envious uh, to see. Uh, let me give you a little bit about the background before I give you the substance of what happened uh, in Bali. We had a good build-up to the ASEAN and ASEAN plus one, ASEAN plus three, and East Asia Summit uh, meeting. There was a lot of anticipation, some degree of exhaustion, because a lot of the leaders had taken part in the G20 and also at APEC. And this is meetings, three big meetings that took place in three continents covering three time zones, right? And within a space of two, three weeks, right? So it's very hectic uh, diplomatic uh, agenda squeeze into uh, the month of uh, November. And this was the last, the East Asia Summit was the last big meetings that we all had to attend for the year of 2011. Of course, we are all uh, excited that there are new members. Uh, America was taking place finally, and Russia also. But because Russia was uh, represented at the foreign minister level, there's much more spotlight on President Obama at the meeting. Uh, there was a feeling that due to the participation of America and Russia, regional architecture was getting stronger, and East Asia Summit was more relevant in addressing regional and uh, global issues. There was some news about the America's uh, enhanced military or marine presence in Darwin at the time. Uh, it was announced by President Obama in Australia. Media made much play about it, uh, and they tried to stoke some kind of conflict or confrontation or new tension going back to Cold War rivalry in the region. But to be honest, none of the leaders were buying that. You know, we knew in in Indonesia that this was going to happen. And we were not worried about it because uh, Australia was a strategic partner for Indonesia and America also was a strategic partner. So we were not worried and what was depicted by the media was uh, not uh, accurate. Uh, around the meeting, uh, we also had uh, uh, themes of Pacific century coming out of the uh, United States. Hillary, Secretary Hillary Clinton wrote about the Pacific century in foreign policy. Uh, my president read it himself. Uh, he, was, uh, he liked uh, the, the, the article. And uh, in Hawaii, Secretary Clinton uh, delivered also that same strong speech about the Pacific century uh, and that the 21st century would be America's Pacific century, that America would now move the strategic pivot from the Middle East to the Asia Pacific. And of course, this is something also that was said by President Obama during the APEC CEO summit. And in fact, my president, when he gave a speech at the uh, APEC CEO summit, he also spoke about what he called not the Pacific century, but the Asia Pacific century. Uh, it is the first time my president used that term, and I think he wanted to send a signal that the 21st century still belongs to Asia, uh, including China and America, Asia Pacific, right? And the only slight difference uh, I would say is that uh, if in the Pacific century, the geopolitical arena is the Pacific Ocean, in the Asia Pacific century, the Indonesian version, we count the Pacific Ocean as well as the Indian Ocean, which we think will be uh, the strategic ocean of the uh, future. But uh, that 
also uh, has the effect of uh, you know, uh, adding more grand strategic vision to the events uh, in Bali. In the region itself, uh, we saw uh, we were all concerned about what happened in Thailand with the floods. Uh, we were very grateful that Prime Minister uh, Ying Lak uh, came to Bali, uh, although she did miss uh, the APEC uh, summit. And uh, we also were encouraged by the positive developments in Myanmar. Uh, we were a bit concerned about heightened tension in the South China Sea, but it, we expected this uh, to be discussed in one of the forums in uh, Bali. And on top of that, there's a lot of uh, feel-good nationalist pride in Indonesia in the run-up to the, uh, the East Asia Summit. Uh, we were hosting the Sea Game, the Southeast Asia Games. Indonesia won, uh, I think, the most gold medals, but we lost the, the most important one, which is the football match against Malaysia, which is why I'm not speaking to our Malaysian colleague who's <laughs> standing in the middle. Uh, uh, and our economy is growing at 6.5% Indonesian economy this year. Uh, the, the ASEAN economy altogether are growing on average of 7.4%, which is uh, significantly higher than the global growth average of 5%. Uh, and the American trade with the region, with ASEAN, uh, is up 27% in 2010 uh, to uh, 180 billion. And the American FDI to the region is up 100%, right? So uh, in contrast to the G20, which was held in Cannes, uh, and um, uh, as Ernie said, I was there as well, and I could feel the mood, you know? Uh, there was a mood of declining confidence, of concern, a crisis of confidence. Uh, the meeting in uh, Bali, in contrast, was a meeting of high expectations, a lot of confidence, uh, a lot of expectations and attentions, and talks about new energy and new movements in Asia, not just diplomatically, but also strategically and uh, economically. And as if all this was not enough, uh, I had to continually monitor a certain Twitter by a very important American who was in Bali at the time, and the name was uh, Paris Hilton. <laughs> uh, I, d I don't know who this person is, but Ernie Bauer said that she was very important American, and her views are very important to millions of Americans. And uh, it's a good thing throughout the whole tweet in Bali, she tweeted like five, ten times a day. She said all nice things, uh, and, and what, by the time she left, uh, I felt good that, uh, you know, uh, good promotion for, for, for Indonesia. So uh, what happens in Bali? What is the result? For us, Indonesia, as the chairman of ASEAN uh, and the organizer of East Asia Summit and, and all the other meetings, we wanted to make sure that Bali was not just another event. You know, ASEAN has now two events a year, two summits a year, right? So we don't want this to be just another event. We want this to be a milestone uh, event in terms of laying down foundations, putting down tractions for the ASEAN community building and shaping future directions. We don't want this to be just a meeting that produced documents, although of course there are bound to be declarations being made, but we want this to have substance and action. Indonesia has always uh, believed that the term ASEAN centrality or the term ASEAN as driving force is not something that we take for granted because we say it often enough, you tend to take that for granted, but we want this to be something that is not empty terms, but has real applications, ASEAN centrality and ASEAN uh, as the driving force of regional architecture. So the major result, the first one that I want to mention is what is called the Bali Concord 3, right? The Bali Concord 3. And uh, this highlights the next stage that we envisage after the ASEAN community reaches its mileage in 2015. So 2015 is only four years away, and it's time for us to start thinking now, what does ASEAN want to do after the ASEAN community has been reached in 2015? So the answer is Bali Concord 3, which means that it, we don't think about ASEAN as a regional community, but we think of ASEAN as part of the global community. Now this means ASEAN has a global role, ASEAN has influence on global issues, and ASEAN has common flat platform, uh, which must be achieved through more coordinated, cohesive, and coherent 
ASEAN position. Now, this is something that was a bit difficult to achieve in the past. You know, on issues like climate change, for example, there's hardly an ASEAN position in contrast to maybe the EU has an EU position on this. So this is something that we are going to change and uh, adjust, having an ASEAN common platform on uh, regional issues. And we know that in order to do this, we're going to have to uh, improve the way ASEAN make decisions, uh, improve the way ASEAN coordinates uh, diplomatically, uh, and also make diplomatic adjustments so to make sure that we do have an ASEAN common position. And one of the things that we did in Bali was enter into a, an agreement with the UN Secretary General called a comprehensive uh, partnership between ASEAN and the UN. And the goal is really to make sure that ASEAN has a more coordinated and coherent voice at the global stage, not just on the regional stage. The second thing uh, is the East Asia Summit uh, principles. Uh, the, uh, what is the, the precise title of it? Uh, uh, there's a document out there that's being produced for you, but it's uh, a mutual uh, principles of norms governing relations between the East Asia Summit. Surprisingly, this is something that the media missed out on. I don't know exactly why they, they were focused a lot on South China Sea and Myanmar and all the other stuff. But for us, this is the key product of the uh, East Asia Summit. That is for all the members of East Asia Summit to agree to a common norms and principle. Now, let me tell you why this is important. Uh, thus far, the most important document of binding norms is what we call the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Now, all the East Asia Summit members have signed on to this. All 18 have signed on to this. But this is more seen as an ASEAN norms with major powers, US, Russia, China, India, and others agreeing to it. Now, we want to establish something that not just binds ASEAN, but also the major uh, powers. And this is what we produce indeed in, uh, uh, in Bali. And the norms are quite uh, extensive. Uh, it covers uh, principles of uh, 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 non-use uh, of form. Let me see where I have it. It covers principles of non-use of forms. Uh, Zelda, where is the document? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so uh, it's a document that contains uh, uh, principles such as the, the non-use of uh, force, uh, peaceful settlement of uh, disputes, uh, the uh, principle of democracy, uh, of uh, human rights, uh, promotion of good neighborliness, uh, respect for international law, uh, respect for diversity of ethnic and religious and cultural traditions, uh, enhancement of regional resilience, and so on and so on. Respect for fundamental freedoms, promotion and protection of human rights and social justice, uh, and so on. Now, look, I say these things and I know what you're thinking. Okay, so what? You know, these are nice words. You know, we hear it all the time. But if you think about it, uh, during the Cold War, imagine having norms like this between the United States, the Soviet Union, and China, right? You could not have something like this done in those days, right? So to have something like this done, and in an environment where you still have a lot of regional hotspots, the North, the Korean Peninsula, the South China Sea, and other things, is quite uh, remarkable. In fact, when we came up with the idea of having a morally binding norms, morally binding, not legally binding, but morally binding norms, uh, there are some who said, okay, it's not gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. They're not ready for it. But surprisingly, we tried it, we proposed it, we made some adjustments, everybody revised some terms here and another, and it happened, and now we have this East Asia norms uh, of uh, conduct. Of course, there's no guarantee that all the norms will be respected. Uh, uh, we are quite uh, uh, pragmatic about this, but at least we can hold East Asia Summit members when they are not accountable to these principles. And we envisage in the future, there's gonna be a lot more issues 
uh, that will come up where we will need to hold them accountable to these norms. Now, the third product that happened was the nuclear weapon free zone, the Southeast Asia nuclear weapon free zones. This is something that was stuck for so many years uh, because uh, there was just little interest on the part of the P5 to sign on to the protocol. But uh, the impetus that was given by President Obama's commitment to uh, nuclear disarmament and other factors made us push this one more time, and guess what? It happened. Uh, by the time we met in Bali, uh, all the P5 members have agreed to, in principle, signing the protocol of Southeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone. There was some discussions with China who were not comfortable with one of the clauses regarding to the territory uh, aspect of the protocol. But this was sorted out, and we expect that in the near future, it's just a matter of procedure, not principle, uh, that there will be a signing uh, of the protocol by the P5 uh, to this uh, important document for us. And what this means for us uh, is that 600 million people in Southeast Asia are now or would now be free and guaranteed to be free from the threat of nuclear weapons. Maritime issue is also uh, uh, discussed uh, in Bali. In fact, it's one of the uh, issues that where there's a lot of back and forth uh, on this issue. And this is an issue where Indonesia felt, look, you know, ASEAN has been gone too slow on this. Uh, the last declaration uh, that was done on South China Sea was a long time ago, it was about 10 years ago, and there was hardly any movement since then. Uh, and if ASEAN wants to prove it's relevant, it has to do something. So uh, we pushed hard for this. We said we can't wait too long or another year or another two years. We got to finalize the guidelines. And it was finalized in July in, in ASEAN. And now the trick is how to move on two things. First, how to move on the projects that were identified in the guidelines uh, on the South China Sea, the ASEAN China guidelines in South China Sea. Secondly, uh, while they're doing that in parallel, how do we identify the elements in the code of conduct uh, as part of the implementation of the uh, declaration on the guidelines of, the co uh, of, of conduct in the South China Sea? So uh, the good news is that now uh, China is, uh, seems to be willing to respond, to sit down to identify the, the elements of the code of conduct. ASEAN, among us, uh, have begun to identify the elements. Uh, we have not brought it out to the attention of China, but uh, uh, China has signaled to us that they are willing to sit down to discuss the next stage, which is identifying the elements of the code of conduct. But uh, what our chairmanship has uh, revealed is that what you need to do is really a little push. You know, sometimes if you let matters just uh, lay uh, for a while, then you don't get any progression, right? But uh, my president pushed really hard uh, last July to make sure that declaration on the guidelines are finalized and now we move on to the next stage which is identifying the elements of the uh, code of conduct. Myanmar was another hot issue. Uh, the media uh, gave a lot of uh, spotlight on, on this issue. Uh, during the meeting of ASEAN leaders, uh, we uh, agreed uh, um, almost unanimously that we were encouraged by the elections that uh, and political development that took part in Myanmar in, in recent times, uh, and the decision was uh, reached uh, to uh, uh, agree to Myanmar's chairmanship of ASEAN by 2014, but in language that would encourage Myanmar to keep up the momentum uh, and in, indeed increase the momentum of political openness and democratization that is uh, already underway. But even here, uh, I want to uh, highlight that here too ASEAN is changing. Because before we reached that decision, uh, Indonesia sent our foreign minister, Foreign Minister Martin Natalagawa, to Myanmar to assess the progress that had been done in the Myanmar's uh, democratization. In the history of ASEAN, that is not something that is usually done. You know, for a member to assess another member state to see if uh, they could now assume the chairmanship. Uh, so it's, there's a mindset shift within ASEAN uh, that is reflected in how we address 
the issue of uh, Myanmar's chairmanship in 2014. Uh, another issue that we discussed and Indonesia pushed very hard for is East Timor's or Timor Leste's membership in ASEAN. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, uh, the views has not always been unanimous on this, but Indonesia believes that uh, Timor Leste is part of Southeast Asia. All you need to do is look at the map, uh, and uh, it is very good for the regional architecture for the Southeast Asia and for ASEAN if Timor Leste joins ASEAN sooner rather than later. So we hope that things are moving in that uh, direction. But now the ASEAN Council of Ministers are studying the modalities by which this can be transpired, getting Timor Leste to be part of ASEAN. Thai Cambodia is another issue. Uh, you know this is an issue that is relevant for ASEAN because we need to show that when there is conflict within ASEAN, ASEAN can be relevant uh, rather than bring this issue to the United Nations Security Council and the others. Uh, I can tell you from, uh, um, uh, from the proceedings that uh, there's much better, uh, both in terms of body language and diplomatic uh, uh, a relationship between the Thai and Prime Minister and, and the Cambodian leader on this issue. Um, they, both of them uh, during the ASEAN summit uh, referred openly to the Thai-Cambodia uh, border issue and they said that things are more manageable and much better now and they do expect that uh, Indonesia will continue to play a role even after Cambodia assumes the chairmanship. Of, uh, of ASEAN. Um, the East Asia Summit also discussed the five issues, uh, the issues that had been discussed all the time in East Asia Summit, which is uh, finance, um, education, energy, uh, natural disasters, and avian flu. These are big issues and we advance them in the Asia, Asia Summit. But uh, we also know that these issues are not exhaustive. Uh, we don't want the East Asia Summit only to be stuck on these five issues. We need to continually expand these issues because after all, East Asia, Asia Summit from the start has always been about discussing political, security, and strategic issues. So we want to make sure that we are flexible in addressing these issues of, uh, of the region. Uh, we had a good U.S. ASEAN summit. Uh, this is the third of its kind, and what is different uh, this time is that they came up with a plan of action uh, because uh, in the first two summits, uh, it's more declaration of, you know, I love you, you love me type of stuff, right? But now there's a beefy, substantive plan of action, and I can tell you that, you know, U.S.-ASEAN partnership is really easy, you know. Uh, they, 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 there's no hard issues that divide us. Uh, there's a lot of uh, goodwill uh, uh, on the two, uh, between the two sides to promote cooperation. So I'm very pleased to see how far it's gone, and we look forward to implementing the plan of action between uh, ASEAN and the, the United States. And uh, I must say that uh, I commend the uh, U.S. participation in, in, in Bali. I think uh, America uh, has uh, shown a very proactive uh, and, and positive engagement with uh, the region, not just with Southeast Asia, but uh, with Asia. Uh, uh, you, you know as well as I do that uh, in, in recent years, uh, there's some concerns that America was just too stuck in Afghanistan and, and Iraq uh, at the expense of its uh, proper attention to the Asia Pacific region. But uh, both President Barack Obama and Secretary Clinton and also Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta when he came to the region, he said that we're back. Uh, President Obama mentioned the word re-engagement in Asia Pacific and uh, we noticed that uh, President Obama went to, of course, to Australia and uh, uh, there's another place that he went to. Uh, and then uh, Secretary Clinton went to all the other American allies and, and, and partners, and they all delivered the same message that uh, America wants to be engaged uh, in the region and become an active uh, participant. And all the things that have been done, the participation in EAS, which is in contrast to the shy approach of America in 2005 towards the EAS, America signing on to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, the U.S. ASEAN Summit, which is an annual thing now, U.S. policy shift on Myanmar, the appointment of U.S. Ambassador David Cardin, a good friend of President Obama, to ASEAN. And you know, all these things signify that America really wants to be an active participant uh, uh, in 
defining the regional architecture of the region. So by way of conclu conclusion, let me say a couple things. Uh, first, you know, throughout all the documents in, in, in Bali, you notice uh, a lot of reference to maritime uh, issues. Maritime security, maritime partnership, maritime cooperation, and, and one of the things that America uh, pushed hard on, uh, this is one of the key issues for them in the East Asia Summit, but it has a caveat on you too, right? Uh, you haven't ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Now, uh, this means that it has become a matter of strate strategic necessity. I repeat, strategic necessity for the United States to ratify UN Convention on Law of the Sea because the more you're going to push hard for it in the East Asia so Summit, in, in U.S. ASEAN Summit, in APEC, and all the other forums, the more the questions are going to come back to you and ask, when are you going to ratify? And when you ratify your diplomatic and political capital in advancing these issues, in addressing South China Sea issues and all the other issues, will significantly rise as well. So my advice to you is ratify soon. Everyone else has, and it's time for America to ratify. Secondly, for ASEAN, uh, we're going to have to live with this uh, spaghetti ball. You know, we have this APEC, uh, ARF, ASEAN plus one, ASEAN plus three, East Asia Summit. There are some calls to rationalize. And in fact, in time, we are, there will be a need to rationalize it. Uh, because uh, all these leaders, they talk about things that overlap between one meeting to the next with mostly the same lead set of leaders as well. But for the time being, it's important to give each of these institutions a room to breathe, you know? Uh, and I think in time, we will feel the need for them to be rationalized. Uh, but in time, I think it's good for us to let each of these institutions to grow. <laughs> but for ASEAN, it is very important for us to learn how to manage this regional architecture, we has, which has a different weight than ASEAN. Now, what do I mean by it? You know, dealing with ASEAN, we're used to this. We've been de dealing with this since 1967 uh, and 1976 and so on, when ASEAN, and, uh, uh, and later on when ASEAN become the ASEAN 10. But dealing with East Asia Summit, where you have US and China and India, is it, completely different diplomatic weight. Uh, and it's becoming an art uh, on how you manage the, the interests, the enormous weight that goes with it uh, between the two uh, uh, giants. We felt it a lot, you know, uh, and the trick is uh, how ASEAN can manage and accommodate them fairly, but also keep in mind that it has to keep ASEAN's interests uh, at heart and as a uh, priority. And it is also important for ASEAN and also for all our friends to remember that with the, with the weight of America and China, uh, there is a host of other interests for us to, 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 to accommodate as well. So it's not just US and China, but also uh, you know, uh, the rest of the 16 member states that we must uh, accommodate and, and manage uh, in terms of their process in managing the regional architecture. I think the principal term that we, uh, we underline uh, in regional architecture is equality. So no matter how big or small, uh, we'd like everybody to have a voice and a role in managing the uh, regional architecture. But for Cambodia, who will uh, be the next chairman of ASEAN, uh, Cambodia will also feel what Indonesia felt, uh, how to manage these two giants and all the competing interests in a fair and constructive and positive way. You know, we have a term in Indonesia, it's called competing for peace. Uh, you know, uh, in, in, uh, what this means is that this is in contrast for competing for power and influence, uh, uh, which means if you're competing for peace, it's a win-win thing. If America and China compete for who gets the most trade and who gets to give the most investments and get the, absorb the most students, it's so much the better for all of us. Uh, whoever wins, everybody wins, right? So that's the term, competing for peace. peace. And my president has underlined the need for us to change the new geopolitics and the new geoeconomics in the Asia-Pacific region, which means, again, uh, there, there will always be an element of rivalry, but there's room for much greater room for partnerships and cooperation and for win-win solution. So hopefully East Asia Summit on these and all these other regional architectures will help advance uh, a better mode for competing for peace among the major powers and regional powers and also for better geopolitics and geoeconomics. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dino, and uh, thank you for agreeing to take some questions. The, uh, the rules on questions are, are really easy. Just uh, raise your hand, I'll uh, identify you, and, uh, and, and please mention your, uh, your name and your affiliation. Um, I'm going to start, though, uh, with the, take the prerogative of the chair and mm -hmm. ask, um, you know, Indonesia had quite a year. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and very successful, mm -hmm. I think, by all accounts, uh, as the chairman of ASEAN and putting together these summits. Everyone's very much aware that we're coming into chairmanship by some of ASEAN's smaller mm -hmm. and newer members. Um, do you have any advice for Cambodia immediately and then the, other, uh, the others that will be chairing uh, ASEAN? What are, the, what are the things they need to think about and get prepared for as they take on the mantle of the chairmanship? Yeah, well, um, preparation is is uh, is uh, is very important, uh, Ernie. Uh, those who took part in the Bali meeting saw how uh, my president and foreign minister really uh, became hands-on manager of Indonesia's uh, foreign policy. He was not just a guy who chaired meetings; he actually led and he studied all the details, uh, and uh, you know he kept telling everybody, let's think outside the box, let's not be married to the past, and whatever we can do differently, let's do it differently, you know. And this is why um, when we engage uh, on the Thai-Cambodia border disputes, which was very unusual for ASEAN standard, we managed uh, to do so. And even when we came up with the idea of sending observers, even though that hasn't happened, and that was accepted by both sides, that also something that was new and reflected thinking outside the box. So I think, uh, uh, our advice to Cambodia is uh, have good preparations, uh, make sure you have a good diplomatic apparatus to handle the, all the ASEAN meetings because we're talking about hundreds of meetings uh, you know, on, on a monthly basis. Uh, and ASEAN has this problem, everybody knows about this, sometimes we come up with too many declarations and not enough implementation. Right? And in the last year what we did was, okay, we look at blueprints, there were one or two points that is good enough, is there, but how come no one's picking up on it? Like the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, the ASEAN Institute for Natural Disasters, right? So all you need to do is just pick up, you don't need to do the whole thing, but pick up the key things that you want to pick up on and make it happen. And that's how you make uh, ASEAN uh, run, run, run faster. But uh, ASEAN, you know, we're developing a style of collective leadership. One guy will be at the, at the helm, but the others can always jump in and give advice and help out. You know, ASEAN belongs to everybody. And the principles that we have laid out will go on for years, uh, uh, not just for, you know, not just for a month or one year, but it will go on uh, for quite some time. And I think it will benefit all the chairmen, future chairmen of ASEAN. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Tom Reckford with the Malaysia America Society. And don't worry, I'm not going to mention the, that football yeah. championship. It's um, too painful to me. <laughs> as a, as a follow-on to, to Ernie's question, you, you mentioned that Indonesia would continue to play a positive role in, in trying to settle the differences between uh, Cambodia and Thailand after uh, 2012, after Cambodia uh, takes on the chairmanship. Is Indonesia planning to continue its very positive and energetic role in many of the other issues uh, after 2012? Okay, well, first on the Thai-Cambodia issue, uh, you know, the, the ICJ has come up with a ruling uh, on, 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 on this, which, uh, demand, which necessitates the creation of the demilitarized zone around the disputed area. So if we do send uh, observers, it will have to be adjusted to the rulings uh, that has been made by the, the ICJ. But yes, of course, we would be very interested to uh, play a constructive role. I think one of the issues that we'll be most interested in is South China Sea issue. You know, uh, we've been involved in this issue since 1991, trying to turn potential conflict into potential cooperation. And if you look at the areas that have been proposed uh, to turn into projects of cooperation, such as marine environment, uh, scientific research and so on. These are the things that Indonesia tried to do for 10 years, but somewhat unsuccessfully and some, you know, only half successful in that. Uh, so uh, we have quite a lot of knowledge uh, 
and, and institutional memory on what not to do and what to do uh, in terms of realizing these projects for cooperation in, in the South China Sea. But, uh, you know, we see hope because uh, if you look at 10, 20 years ago in South China Sea, China did not want to discuss this with anybody, right? And then China said, okay, we discuss it, but only bilaterally, right? And then it moved again. He said, okay, we discuss it, but only with ASEAN, which is where we are now, you know, China and ASEAN, and China saying, okay, everybody else move away, only me and ASEAN. And then China saying, okay, now maybe we can discuss projects, right? But the point is, uh, there has been movements in China's position on the South China Sea in ways that we hope uh, can be turned into more diplomatic uh, agreements for peaceful negotiations and settlement in the South China Sea. So uh, I think, I, I imagine South China Sea will be one of the issues that will be priority interest for Indonesia. I have uh, Kumar and then Alex. Sure. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, my question is about, you mentioned uh, China was concerned about uh, the nuclear free Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. and then it was sorted out. Do you know what issues they were concerned and how it was sorted out, and okay. what impact it will have on the South China Sea? You also I'm Kumar from Amnesty International. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Kumar. Uh, the, the issue was on uh, the definition of territory. You know, China uh, claims uh, the South China Sea and claims uh, the islands and also the maritime space. And uh, they wanted to be clear on the geographical scope of the territory. And they did not want any clause that would prejudice, be preju prejudicial to their territorial claims uh, in the South China Sea. So they came up with a, a solution that would have a memo that would be uh, indicating that, that when they sign on to this protocol, then it does not uh, affect their territorial claims. And that's what's going to be signed. Uh, so uh, principally has been agreed by all the P5, but it's basically uh, on the question of that here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Alex Feldman from Hi, the Alex. and Business Council. Um, I uh, wanted to ask, there was, there was another important meeting that took place in Bali and, and asked uh, maybe if you could give us some insights into what happened, and that was the meeting between President Obama and President Ido Yono. And if you could uh, talk a little bit about U.S.-Indonesian uh, uh, relations in regards okay. to that. Did that take place? Yeah. I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, President Obama had a very good meeting with President Ido Yono. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that they unveiled was the Indonesia going into the Compact program. Uh, uh, where Indonesia would receive $600 million uh, for uh, development purpose. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, a, big, a big item for the bilateral part is the Lion, Boeing, Lion Air Boeing deal, which is $22 billion, uh, the largest deal ever uh, made by Boeing and the Indonesian private airline is doing this, they're buying 230 planes from Boeing. So we are very much contributing to American uh, jobs uh, as well, <laughs> right? Uh, but, uh, you know, we have, we, the feeling was the bilateral side is very good, Alex, very good and solid, uh, expanding. We had a good joint uh, commission meeting, working group meetings, and extensive agenda covering food, energy, environment, climate change, trade investment, and so on. And uh, there was uh, questions about, not questions, the, the discussions were also a, more about regional and global environment. And that's, that's a, a new thing about Indonesia-US relations. We discuss more things now about what to do with the region, what to do with the world, right? uh, which reflects a maturing relationship, uh, I suppose. But uh, they had very good uh, meeting, good bilateral uh, meeting uh, on the sidelines of Bali. Um, but besides that also, I noticed uh, there was a dinner uh, that was held uh, where all the leaders were watching a show for two hours and they were dressed in batik and uh, had Indonesian food. Uh, there was another uh, uh, positive, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, side impact, uh, which was President Obama sat next to Prime Minister Wen Jiabao, right? And on his left was President Yudhoyono. But that two hours, the two were talking the whole time and talking, I think they're talking serious stuff, uh, because uh, I, um, it, it, 
offered a rare occasion for President Obama and President Wen Jiabao to discuss uh, issues in a very informal way, without the advisors uh, and without note takers, only the interpreters, for two hours. Uh, and then we thought, um, I think more meetings like this, uh, uh, this is one of the things that do not uh, show themselves in formal diplomatic documents, but have a lot of impacts in terms of improving the psychology uh, of, of uh, the relationship between the leaders. Yeah. I'm Kenton Clymer from um, the Wilson Center at Northern Illinois University, where you were a few months ago. Yes. Um, I would just wondered if you could expand a bit on your uh, comments about Myanmar. Um, everyone, I think, is encouraged uh, with what has happened so far, and I'd just be interested in your own kind of personal assessment uh, of the future. Uh, do you think uh, there will be you know, more opening up? Do you think the political prisoners will be released and so forth? Yeah, okay. Well, fair question. I think, oh, look, uh, how you assess the situation in Myanmar depends on two, what yards that you want. Do you want a... Uh, a, a big, sudden, dramatic improvement, or you want incremental one, but significant, right? Um, you want something overnight, or you want something not overnight and not too long, but uh, achievable within, within our time. Uh, I think ASEAN is, uh, ex is expecting a significant, but also incremental uh, political changes in Myanmar. And this is what we see. Uh, we are heartened by the growing relationship and hopefully trust, I think trust, between President Thein Sen and Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, I think this is something that she has reflected. And that is a good sign. If she trusts somebody and she feels comfortable with somebody, then it is a good sign. Uh, we've been heartened by the release of political prisoners, even though we understand that there's still about 2,000 political prisoners uh, in, in Myanmar, and we keep encouraging them to, uh, to release them. There's now a new dialogue, and then the NLD now has been allowed to take part in elections and also on San Suu Kyi by December next year, although that's also uh, at the provincial level. But it's a good stepping stone. Uh, for us also, uh, you know, we had a democratic change. Uh, we had elections in 1999. But real reforms and real political openness and maturing of democracy took several years, I think four or five years after that actual elections in 1999 uh, to bring us where we are today. So in Myanmar, I think uh, uh, the trick is to encourage them to go as fast as they can uh, to promote reforms and also to not forget there's another side of the coin of the issue, which is the relationship with the uh, ethnic groups that are rebelling against uh, Yangon. You know, I think uh, from Washington, uh, sometimes we are too fixed on the human rights and democracy side, but the other side, the other 50% is also very important and they've been uh, trying to hold meetings with them and in constructive ways. So if they get democracy, human rights, and the uh, regional ethnic rebellions right, then I think uh, we're, we're going to see one of the most remarkable transformations in, in Southeast Asia uh, in, in Myanmar in the following years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jerry, did you? Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Jerry Hyman at CSIS. Hi, Jerry. Um, thank you for that great briefing and for the remarkable achievements of the last uh, year by Indonesia. Um, especially on the EAS norms and principles, um, I think that's, that's fantastic. If I could ask you about the Bali Concord three uh, issues that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about um, common platforms and common positions. Mm -hmm. what, what would that mean for the traditional ASEAN position of unanimity uh, in order to have any kind of uh, agreements about almost anything? Could you do that and still have common positions and principles uh, on specific issues as you go forward if you see that um, robustly? Yeah, well, it's a good question because uh, that is where uh, it's still a bit vague uh, in the sense that we want ASEAN to go faster and make stronger decisions, more coherent positions, uh, and we know that the principal consensus is still there. But there is a, something in the ASEAN Charter that says that if the uh, leaders cannot achieve consensus, then the chairman can do something to find a way. Now, they stop short of saying voting, right? They stop short of saying voting, but it's not entirely out of the question. But 
it is a mechanism that has not been spelled out uh, completely. Uh, on economic issues, uh, there is something that says that uh, if one group does not feel comfortable with one of the tariffs or uh, t schemes or economic cooperation schemes, that member can opt out of the consensus and let others go forward. So there are different ways, different mechanisms, but nothing uh, concretely spelled out in terms of how ASEAN can move faster. Uh, what's there is only the realization and the political will to do so. And I think we achieved that. Uh, I think what we did in South China Sea when we said, look, 10 years is just way too long to wait with no results whatsoever. Let's get it done now. You know, the moment Indonesia said it, uh, and others also, uh, we, we push others and others agreed with us, uh, then decision became faster. So sometimes it's just a matter of chasing uh, decisions and, and pushing hard on it. Yeah. Uh, one, one, one example is uh, human rights. Uh, when we uh, when we designed the ASEAN Charter, human rights and democracy was almost uh, not a, a very minimal part of it. But Indonesia, you know, we believe that, look, even Africa uh, has a human rights charter, you know. Uh, and and uh, what's ASEAN afraid of? What, what, are we, what are we afraid of in the 21st century when in promoting democracy and human rights? We push hard and we reverse uh, the, the tide in, within ASEAN discussions and now uh, democracy and human rights is very much part of the ASEAN Charter and so again it's just a matter of pushing sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Mark, yeah. Good morning Ambassador, Mark Mealy, U.S. Housing and Business hey, Council. Mark. When you mentioned earlier the, the issue, you mentioned the term spaghetti bowl and oftentimes in this town when we think of that we think of sort of FTAs and sort of trade initiatives and obviously we know there's lots of, uh, how should we say, uh, uh, competing potential architectures around the trade uh, evolution uh, for Asia. So I'm curious, from your point of view or from Indonesia's point of view, how you felt in terms of the EAS context or even some of the ASEAN summit context, how is ASEAN kind of thinking about, again, maintaining that principle of ASEAN centrality in whatever evolution of trade, landscape, architecture that's going to emerge in Asia? Yeah, well, thanks. Um, well, uh, let, let me let me mention a little bit about the TPP, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, there was a significant announcement in TPP in, in Honolulu, right? Uh, and we noticed that, uh, that TPP is gaining more attention. And even when the leaders met in Bali, uh, people were talking about TPP on the sidelines, although it wasn't pr uh, discussed in, 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 in the meetings. But uh, the point is it, add, it has added new dynamism. Uh, even Indonesia, we're not saying no to TPP. We're, we're looking at it with, uh, you know, we're just studying it. Yeah, uh, But we notice, uh, I think, Canada, Mexico, J uh, Japan, and Korea uh, have expressed interest uh, in, in uh, TPP. Uh, what is important for us uh, is the, the WTO actually. Uh, for us, the, the real game is in the WTO when we need to make sure that there is a, uh, a resolution uh, in, in the, uh, Do the Doha round. Uh, but uh, Pascal Lamy has said that uh, 90 something percent of WTO negotiations are, are done. It just comes down to specific issues between America and China, <laughs> right? And unfortunately, uh, in the current election issue, I think it's a bit too much to hope that uh, that will be resolved uh, in the coming year or so. Uh, but for us, uh, it's very important for us to achieve some kind of resolution or advancement in the Doha round. And we do hope that, you know, ASEAN, um, um, the ASEAN Master Plan of Connectivity uh, it's a big thing for ASEAN now. This is the next big thing in terms of infrastructure, uh, telecommunications, transport, and everything. And uh, I forget the figures, but it's something like a couple hundred or a couple thousand billion dollars for the next couple of years, which is a lot of opportunities for America and China and everybody, all our friends around the region. So, and I'm glad that at the U.S. ASEAN Summit, President Obama has expressed his full support for the ASEAN Master Plan for Connectivity to be part of that uh, uh, great regional project of ours, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for those remarks. Uh, we talk, a lot of coverage was given to China, U.S., and ASEAN, uh, but the other large country, India, never gets mentioned. What's ASEAN's view of India, and what do you think, what does ASEAN think India thinks about the East Asian Summit? Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, well, uh, we did have a ASEAN-India uh, Summit uh, in, in, in Bali, and uh, the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Manwan Singh came. Uh, 
I'm not, uh, I didn't attend that meeting, so I'm, I don't want to uh, say much about something that I'm not very knowledgeable uh, about. Uh, but definitely when we see the regional architecture, we see India very much as part of it. Uh, as you know, uh, before the East Asia Summit, there were two competing ideas. One is just East Asia, uh, and the other one was East Asia Plus. Plus what? Plus Australia, New Zealand, and India, uh, which means that we see the region not just as an, more narrow, but a lot more larger, uh, and we want to achieve a lot more balance, and we believe that balance will be achieved with India's participation with uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand, and now with China and the United, uh, uh, now with Russia and the United States. So uh, um, uh, India is very much part of our design in terms of uh, uh, maintaining this dynamic equilibrium in the Asia Pacific, and especially because in Indonesia's view, and uh, perhaps also in, in ASEAN's view, uh, the Indian Ocean is going to be the strategic zone of the future. Uh, there's going to be a lot more geopolitical and geoeconomic movements in, in that area. Um, and and uh, unfortunately, in contrast with the Pacific side, uh, the regional architecture in the Indian Ocean is still lacking. It's still very minimal. Uh, and uh, I think that's going to be the next uh, big thing. And uh, India's role will be very important in that respect. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bob Dehan with the National Fisheries Institute. Um, Mr. Ambassador, my question was sort of already asked and answered. Um, just want to encourage your government to give serious consideration to joining the TPP talks because they are picking up steam. And that is, um, <clears throat> as a former person in government on trade, that they, they show a lot more promise than the WTO round that we've been working on since the Eisenhower administration, it seems like. <laughs> yeah. I, Thank you. Okay. Just a quick comment of that. Uh, you know, when the PP started, it was only five countries, right? Uh, Singapore, Chile, Brunei, and something. Uh, now it's become a different thing, you know, uh, with the United States uh, joining, especially. Uh, it's really becoming a different game, uh, for, and we know this, right? Uh, a TPP with five countries and TPP with nine countries is very different, and uh, uh, so, so and I uh, take it very well what you say, and this is the message that I convey to my government as well, that this is a different game now with America being part of it and this being nine countries as opposed to four or five countries. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our, <laughs> our speaker.